Mascots are fun, and you can find them almost anywhere. From your favorite sports team to your favorite fast food chain, those fun little characters seem to represent just about everything. And I totally get why. They are recognizable and merchandisable, two things that marketing agents are really into. I mean, just think about it. What is McDonald's without Ronald, or the Philadelphia football team without the eagle, or Twitter without that little bird? There's one mascot, however, who has a dark secret, and to uncover it, we have to go back to the 1980s. My name is Josh, and this is Obscure History. In the world of marketing, there are many different kinds of branding. Here are some of the most popular. You've got the word mark, which is essentially just as it sounds. It's a stylized word. Some examples that come to mind are Disney, Google, Vans, and IBM. A good word mark not only is attractive, but it conveys an important message about the company it represents. Disney has the swirly, creative, kind of charming script that lets you know that their product will be fun and whimsical. Similarly, the FedEx logo appears at first to be a clinical, sort of corporate impact font, but the closer you look, your eyes are drawn to the arrow that's formed in the negative space in between the E and the X. This cleverly communicates to the consumer that FedEx is not only professional, but they're very active. Then there's the emblem. You can think of this kind of branding like a badge. The emblem is my personal favorite type of branding. They often feature the name of the product just like a wordmark, but there's also other images and visual elements too. And it's usually all contained in a simple shape that allows the design to reproduce well on a variety of surfaces. Some notable examples would be Converse Shoes, BMW, Starbucks Coffee, Harley Davidson, and even Obscure History. Emblems also evoke a sense of uniformity and cohesion. You can slap a well-made emblem onto just about anything and it communicates the same message. There's also the brand mark, which is just a symbol that attempts to communicate the product to the consumers. Think like the Apple logo or the Nike swoosh or the Target logo. The brand mark is a bit trickier to do properly. A brand mark has to be perfect to really do its job. Like, when I rebranded this show, I could have just used an icon of, like, a stylized book or something. But only those of us that already know about the show would even know what that meant. Today, the Nike swoosh is one of the most iconic pieces of branding out there, but when people saw it for the first time, I would imagine it took them a while to connect the dots. Finally, there's the mascot. These guys are drafted up by marketing teams to perfectly represent their brand, and they are massively popular. And they're prevalent in just about every industry. In the food industry, you've got Ronald McDonald, Colonel Sanders, Wendy, Tony the Tiger, and Count Chocula, just to name a very narrow few. I'm sure that you were thinking of even more as I was just listing those. Basically, every sports team has a mascot of some kind. The Seattle Seahawks, the Winnipeg Jets, or the Los Angeles Angels. You could even argue that people like Flo the Progressive Lady or Lily Adams the AT&T Girl are corporate mascots as well. There is one more type of corporate branding that is much less common. It's the corporate mascot villain. Usually these characters are over-the-top thieves who spend their entire existence trying to get to the company's product because it is just that good. Some notable mentions in this category are the Trix Rabbit, the Hamburglar, and maybe even Lucky the Lucky Charms Leprechaun. However, there was one corporate villain whose dastardly deeds were so infuriating, it inspired real-life chaos. The year was 1986. Hair was big, music was weird, and blouses had such impressive shoulder pads teenage girls looked like they were suiting up to tackle Eric Dickerson or Dan Marino in the backfield. 
The Cosby Show, Family Ties, and Cheers were blasted into the living room of almost every home in the U.S., while the theaters were dominated by Ferris Bueller, a ragtag group of kids finding a dead body, and David Bowie playing a mostly biographical role in Labyrinth. It was a time of larger-than-life aesthetics and larger-than-life icons. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lawrence Taylor, and Mike Tyson were the epitome of manliness, while Princess Diana, Ali Sheedy, and Molly Ringwald were defining an era of style. Ronald Reagan was eating jelly bellies in the Oval Office, and Joan Jett was rocking through the airwaves. It's easy to see how people romanticized the 1980s. A person could spend $80,000 on a home, $8,000 on a brand new Mustang, and $3,000 a year on college tuition. New York City subway fares were a dollar, and gas was even less than that. The streets were abuzz with excited conversations about Haley's Comet and that newfangled laptop computer. Even though everyone knew somebody who had a son who was worshipping the devil and playing Dungeons and Dragons, 1986 was bright and rich and peppy. But while the world around them was alive with the swirling wails of synthesizer music, the marketing firm Group 243 were locked away in a sterile office building crafting one of the most sinister corporate mascots ever devised. In 1960, brothers Tom and James Monahan purchased Dominic's Pizza Shop on the outskirts of Eastern Michigan University. As it stood, Dominic's was a lost cause. The shop had been failing financially, and it proved to be a difficult fixer-upper for the brothers. After a couple years of slow business, James sold his share of the company to his brother for a used Volkswagen Bug. In hindsight, this was one of James Monahan's biggest business blunders. After renaming the shop to Domino's in 1965, business took off and profits began pouring in. Tom Monahan invested wisely, played the game just right, and grew those profits into a pizza empire. By 1983, Domino's had opened up 1,000 franchises. In an attempt to push profits even farther, Monahan contracted Group 243 to create a unique character to represent the Domino's brand, and they delivered. The marketing firm concocted a strange claymation man. He was a diabolical man, hell-bent on ruining Domino's Pizza for the hungry consumer. This unholy creature donned a maroon bunny suit, emblazoned with a bold N across the torso. His hands and feet were obscured by oversized white gloves and booties. His name was The Noid, and he was crafted by Group 243 to be the antithesis of the ideal pizza experience. His mission was to make you miserable. This might seem counterintuitive, but it actually worked in Domino's favor. Rather than having a mascot who outright exalts the virtues of the company, the Noid was used as a sort of proxy to highlight the benefits of ordering your pizza from Domino's. In one commercial, the Noid is shown wildly controlling this weather contraption while a dutiful Domino's delivery driver does their very best to make it to the customer through torrential rain and hurricane winds. The delivery person does eventually make it to the customer's house, and at this point the Noid is pumped because he thinks that he made the pizza freezing cold and soggy. But because of Domino's patented delivery bag, the pizza was handed over to the enthusiastic customer, hot, tasty, and glowing with some mysterious celestial radiance. Interestingly, Domino's also sort of weaponized the Noid. Ads set up a terrible situation like, Have you ever ordered pizza for your daughter's birthday party and everyone's super excited, but when it gets there, it's half-frozen garbage? Avoid the Noid. Order from Domino's. Not only did Domino's use the Noid to highlight their own greatness, but they strongly implied that if you ordered your pizza from anywhere else, the Noid would ruin your life and would deliver you literal pig slop in a cardboard box. In fact, here's a very brief sample of what a classic Noid commercial sounded like. Avoid the Noid with the Domino's Pizza Guarantee. We guarantee your pizza will be delivered within 30 minutes or you get $3 off your order. Guaranteed. And we guarantee your pizza will taste great. If you're not satisfied with your pizza, we'll replace it or refund your money. Only our pizza is guaranteed to avoid the Noid. Domino's Pizza delivers. Call now. 
The Noid succeeded at far more than just providing a corporate identity to a rapidly growing pizza chain. The Noid became a cultural icon. The strange rabbit man appeared in commercials, video games, clothing, toys, Michael Jackson music videos, and there was even an animated series approved by CBS that ultimately fell through before production could begin. In my hometown, there was even a giant mural of the Noid on the old brick wall of the Domino's. When you parked your car to pick up your order, it was the Noid's manic gaze that first greeted you. The Noid was wildly successful as a mascot. The Noid was everything that the Trix Rabbit wished it could be. While the Lucky Charms Leprechaun was busy trying to steal marshmallows from children, the Noid was moonwalking with Michael Jackson and making cameos in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies. The Noid was everywhere. Unfortunately, this exposure would lead to tragedy. But before we get into the mayhem brought on by the Noid, let's hear from some sponsors. Today's episode was brought to you in part by Indie Drop-In Network's Scary Time Podcast. If you like this show, then you already like one independently produced podcast. Maybe you don't think of this show as an indie show because statistically it's very likely that you found this on the front page of Apple, which is, I promise you, completely dumb luck that my show was ever there. Um, But what Indie Drop-In Network does is each week they share an episode from an independently produced podcast, so it's always something fresh and always something new. I personally listened to a couple of the more recent episodes of Scary Time today, and I've got to tell you, they were entertaining and interesting. So if you want to try something new today, follow the link in my show's description to Indie Drop-In Network's Scary Time Podcast and tell Greg that I sent you. This episode was also brought to you in part by Horrible History. Have you ever wished that I were funnier and was also two ladies? (laughs) If you've ever made those two very specific wishes, then Horrible History is a perfect fit for you. Every week, Emily and Rachel take you through the past in the most entertaining way possible. In their last episode, Emily talks about the terrible story behind an infamous headline, Headless Body in Topless Bar, then Rachel shares about the life and death of Buddy Holly. It's great stuff, and I hope you check them out as soon as you're done listening to this episode. You can find all of their stuff at their website, HorribleHistoryPodcast.com, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll share a link to that website and their Apple Podcast page in the show notes of this episode. On January 30th, 1989, Sam Burnsett and Daryl Wilson were tending the pizza ovens at a Domino's in Chambly, Georgia. Things were going as they had always gone. It always seems as if there's a comfortable predictability before chaos, a stillness before the downpour. Shortly after opening the store, a man walked in. Burns said noticed that he was of slightly above average height and seemed distraught, but what really caught his attention was the glimmer of the 357 Magnum handgun clenched tightly in the fist of the man. The man demanded that Burns said call Tom Monahan directly. Burns said hesitantly picked up the phone and dialed the only corporate number he could remember, the Domino's safety hotline. Burns said began to explain the situation to the person on the other end of the line. They didn't seem to be taking it seriously, but as Burns had tried to communicate the severity of the situation, the man pulled the trigger on his gun and pierced the ceiling with its deadly power. Before Burns had could say anything further, the man grabbed the phone from him, threatened to kill the boys if the authorities were to show up, then slammed the phone down on the receiver. The phones began ringing off the hook as Domino's corporate and the authorities desperately tried to understand what was happening in that small store. The man waving the gun around was Kenneth Lamar Noyd, a 22-year-old Albany native who was in the midst of a mental break. Though he certainly was prepared to cause serious harm to whoever happened to be working at Domino's that day, I think it's important to note that statistically, those who are struggling with severe mental health problems are far more likely to have violence perpetrated against them than the other way around. Kenneth was the exception to that rule. Burnsed told reporters that he was speaking almost incoherently and was acting paranoid and agitated. Eventually, Kenneth would inform hostage negotiators that he thought Tom Monahan had created the Noid specifically to mock him, and that he was owed $10,000, a white limo getaway car, 
in a copy of the sci-fi novel The Widow's Son. Word of the assault made its way back to Domino's corporate in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Tom Monahan, as well as other Domino's executives, were anxiously awaiting to receive an update from the Chambly store. It's said that Monahan even offered to use his private jet to evacuate Burnside and Wilson from the store, but that idea was impractical at best. Burnside tried to have sympathy on Noid, who was very clearly having severe mental health problems. He offered Noid two large pizzas with everything on them. Noid agreed to this, and while he was eating the pizzas, Burnside and Wilson ran out the door. Now alone and armed in the store, Noid refused to leave or negotiate. He fired his gun into the roof whenever anyone tried to make a move. It was a complete deadlock. After hours of negotiation, Noid eventually surrendered around 5 p.m., possibly 10 hours after arriving that morning. He was charged with kidnapping, aggravated assault, and theft by extortion. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity at his trial. Rather than be thrown in jail and locked up, Noid was sent to receive intense mental health support at a clinic. For as traumatic as this experience was, Domino's continued to run absurd Noid ads while Kenneth was getting mental health treatment. Wanna keep the Noid out? You just gotta shout! 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 That nasty dude is after your food! Shout! 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 Domino's! You want Domino's Pizza? It's kind of bewildering that Domino's didn't move on from the Noid after that horrible January day. In fact, they continued to run Noid ads until 1995. Kenneth Lamar Noid was released from his mental health treatment, but he was far from rehabilitated. Still believing that Tom Monahan was personally targeting him by running the Avoid the Noid campaign, Kenneth Lamar Noid took his own life tragically in 1995. His obituary reads, A native of Albany, Georgia, he had lived in Tallahassee for three years. He was an American Legion member, a member of Quilters Unlimited, and Faith Baptist Church. He is survived by his wife, Elizabeth Moyer of Tallahassee, two daughters, Maria and Tiffany Hawkins, both of Livonia, Georgia, his mother, Julia Noyd Goines, and his father, Bill Knox of Dawson, Georgia three brothers, Earl, Eric, and Brenton Nelson, and a sister, Cynthia Noyd of Dawson. It's easy for us to look at these crazy stories and sort of detach from them, but the people that we discussed on this show were real, and they had families and friends and a place in this world. After 1995, Domino's put the Noyd away quietly, but they didn't retire him forever. In 2009, Domino's produced a limited run of t-shirts featuring the Noid's image. Starting in about 2011, the Noid began making cameos in Domino's commercials, but it wasn't until recently that Domino's decided to bring the Noid back for real. In April of 2021, Domino's released some cryptic hype videos that alluded to the return of the Noid, which they later announced officially. The Noid appeared in a mobile Crash Bandicoot game and even starred in a Domino's ad which proposes the possibility of self-driving delivery cars. It's not fair to pin someone's mental health solely on the actions of a giant corporation, but there are times where companies contribute to problems through their advertising tactics. It's not fair to Tom Monahan and Domino's that a man suffering from severe mental health problems lashed out at their beloved mascot, but it's also not fair to Kenneth Noid that Domino's continued pushing Noid ads even after the incident. Perhaps Domino's corporate just thought that Kenneth Noid had disappeared into a mental health facility and that he would be rehabilitated and maybe they could just laugh it off later. More likely, I think they probably just forgot about it and pushed it under the rug. Regardless, As we see Domino's push more Noid content in 2021, let's remember that this weird... Part man, part bunny mascot was responsible, either knowingly or unknowingly, for a desperate act of violence and an avoidable tragedy. 
All right, everybody. That is the end of this wild ride. Thank you so much for listening. I seriously appreciate all of you. I'll put the links to Horrible History and Any Drop-In Network's Scary Time Show in the show notes. Please go check those links out. When you check out the links that I put in the show notes, it actually helps me out a ton. Not always financially. Sometimes it just helps me build connections in the podcasting community, and sometimes those can even be more valuable than the couple bucks in ad revenue I get per episode. If you like this episode, then go ahead and tell your friends, share it on social media, send me an email or a DM, or if this was your first time listening, then just subscribe and follow along for future episodes. Taking us out today is Virgo Gabriel with their song Feel My Flow. It is such a fun track. It's got this really cool vibe. Like, it honestly makes me feel cooler just for listening to it. As always, I'll post a link to Virgo Gabriel's music in the show notes. Please go check out their music if you like this track. And if you've got an indie music that you want me to feature, or if you've got like a friend who's got a band or something and they want to get their music out into the world, send me an email or have them send me an email at uh, obscurehistorypod at gmail.com. Uh... Oh, include a link to their music in that email, um, because sometimes, uh, like, people have their songs on, like, one place and not the other. Um, But anyways, uh, all right, I've got to go. I'm actually going on vacation next week, so I'm going to try my hardest to get an episode out. But just know that Monday of next week, when you want to be enjoying an episode, I will be enjoying the beach, I think. (laughs) Okay, you guys have an awesome week. I'll talk to you later. Mm